Hello and uh, welcome to Heart of the Matter. I just um, want to make a short little announcement before um, we get started uh, with my guest that's come to join me, which is Mark Devlin. And uh, what I'd like to share is that um, over the last few months, um, my mum's become increasingly sort of unwell. And then we found out that she was uh, diagnosed with cancer and she passed away in sort of September time. So I just wanted to put that sort of out there to our viewers. And um, I just want to thank you for your sort of understanding and your patience. And um, looking forward to bringing some more podcasts to this channel in the next few uh, few months and uh, in the near future as well. Um, with Ahmed and uh, with Chloe and other guests as well. So I just want to welcome you back, Mark, and um, thank you for coming back to the channel. You know, it's been, I think, about a year since the last time that we uh, we last spoke, and uh, we were here to share about your new book. So um, welcome, Mark. It's uh, an honour to have you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kelvin. I think it has been about a year uh, mm. because we booked these well in advance. So I remember putting in the in the diary that we were going to chat in November uh, several mm. months ago because I'm so busy with stuff that I have to plan that far in advance. But yeah, it's good to reconnect. And of course, there's lots to talk about. Yeah, thank you. And um, obviously, um, we're here to do um, a topic on your, your, your sort of, well, conversation on your, your, your new book, um, which is a follow on from your, your first book, which is, yes, The Gift and the Curse. So, um, yeah, Mark, I, I sort of um, I've read little bits and pieces of it, um, obviously, from the back notes, because obviously due to what's happened with my mum, I haven't sort of had the time to sort of go through the book. But um, I know it's sort of based in Oxford. I know it's um, got to sort of do with the elites. Um, and I also sort of know that um, there's a sort of a spiritual theme running through the book as well. So, yeah, um, it'd be just great for you to share your insights on our, on, on your new book. And, um, you know, as I uh, go through this with the viewers, well, I'll be learning as well. So I'm, I'm sure I'll jump in some, with some questions on, on uh, as we go through the podcast. Thank you, Mark. Sure. So the book is a follow up to the one that I put out in 2019, which was called The Cause and the Cure. And it's almost as if I knew what was coming in 2020 with that title. Uh, not that I did, but it seems quite prophetic in the circumstances. So I really enjoyed the process of putting that book together. And it was my first attempt at writing fiction. So up to that point, I'd written two of my musical truth books, which are obviously nonfiction, talking about what goes on in the world and the true nature of the music industry. So I just enjoyed this process so much that I always had it in mind that I wanted to do a sequel. So this is it. This is the second book following up the cause and the cure. It's called The Gift and the Curse. I'm going to do a trilogy. So I'm going to finish off with another novel in uh, a couple of years. I don't know what it's going to be called yet, but it's going to be The Something and The Something Else. So at least I've got the the bits in there. Okay. So <laughs> this one was called The Cause and the Cure, which is a variation on a house record called The Cure and the Cause by Fish Go Deep. And this one, The Gift and the Curse, was the title of a Jay-Z album. So I used to be a fan of Jay-Z back in the days when I was a hip-hop DJ, but uh, I don't mess with Jay-Z anymore since I've discovered the true nature of what he's all about and what he represents. So this book, like its predecessor, is set in Oxford. So I was born in Oxford. Uh, it just seems like a, an ironic twist of fate that I happen to have come into the world in the place which is the breeding ground for the so-called Illuminati. So Oxford, of course, is where all the system players go to get their training and their indoctrination at Oxford University. So, you know, you had the likes of Osama bin Laden studied at Oxford. Uh, Bill Clinton studied there. And of course, prime ministers like David Cameron, uh, Boris Johnson, they were all at Oxford. So it's definitely a place that churns out some of these key characters. I never went to college or university in Oxford. I just happened to be born there. So uh, contrary to what a lot of people think, there are regular folk in Oxford who are just like anybody else who are not part of that establishment system. But it does remain a fascinating city in which to set a story because it's got so much history, so much heritage, and I know the place very well. So the first story was set in the early 90s. I know the 90s very well because it was my favourite decade. Uh, so the story is in 1990 and 91. The world, as I'm sure you remember, Kelvin, was very different back in the early 90s. It just feels like a different lifetime, a different existence. And in the new book, it moves on 10 years to 2001 
and it's set against the backdrop of the events of September 11th. So we've got many of the same characters that I created for the first story, and we find them one decade on having to deal with the zeitgeist of the times. Things have shifted, the news of the 9-11 attacks has just come in, and the basis of the storyline is that the characters discover that there's a plot underway to stage Oxford's very own version of 9-11. And it's designed to exploit all the paranoia about Muslims that was around at the time, and really just use that to, to the extreme and get this attack blamed on them. So uh, I won't reveal every aspect of the story, but of course I have to reveal that the building in question that the elites so-called plan to blow up is this one. It's a very iconic building in Oxford. It's called the Radcliffe Camera. It was originally a reading room and a library. It's very distinctive. It looks a little bit like the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And so we've got this so-called elite secret society network known simply as the Order, as in New World Order. So in the first book, I introduced the concept of the Order, and Oxford serves as a microcosm of the world. So everything that happens in the city within the ring road is a representation of what's happening in the wider world. So you've got the order and they run every aspect of things in Oxford. And of course, that's a representation of what happens in the world. We have various networks and various groups who are really calling the shots. You know, Rishi Sunak is not running the UK. He answers to higher powers and overlords and masters and does their will. And it's the same in every country around the world. So in the story, this becomes apparent. And within the order, you've got people who have very respectable outward positions in terms of their interface with the public. So the main guy that I've introduced and Many of the names, by the way, of my characters are coded, so the names mean something. Uh, one of the uh, less subtle names is a guy named Eugene Nix. Get it? Eugene Nix. And so he's the head of the order. And by day, he's the Lord Mayor of Oxford. So very respectable facade. But at night, he attends these rituals these ceremonies at the Hellfire Caves in West Wickham, just outside High Wickham. That's about 20 odd miles just outside Oxford off the M40. And in the book, I've got the order holding their meetings in this place. Now, this place is very real. And actually, all the locations that I have in the book are very real places that anyone can go to and visit for themselves. And I do plan to do some walking tours of Oxford in the next few weeks, where I take a small group of interested people around some of the sites where the story takes place. So you've got this guy who's a mayor by day, but he's running this occult mystery school secret society in his spare time. And then you've got a guy who is the head of the Anglican Church. He's a bishop in Oxford, but he's a part of that system as well. And at that meeting at the Hellfire Caves, you get to meet the managing director of the main radio station, the main TV station, the proprietor of the main newspaper in Oxford. You get the head of the police, you get judges. And of course, this is a representation of society in general as well, because people in these kinds of positions are behind the scenes, really running the show and dictating what goes on in the world. So once again, in this story, Oxford just serves as a symbolic representation of the world at large. And I've got the main characters and the responsibility falls on their shoulders to prevent this terrible event from happening. There's basically six of them. So this small group of six people realize that the entire fate of everyone else in the city and therefore in the world depends on them taking right action and doing what they know they must. So I'll pause there in case you want to jump in and ask me anything else. Yeah, uh, it sounds like a very common theme, Mark, um, you know, um, from me and my journey and what I've gone through. Um, as I know, you know, myself, that I've, I've learned not to be 
one of these people that's on the chessboard, as they say, you know, um, because we see the bigger picture. And, uh, yeah, it's very insightful, very, very insightful. And, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> what can I say, Mark? You know, it's no surprise to me. Put it that way, brother. No surprise. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so in the names, like I say, you've got some clues as to the true nature of the characters. So you learn something about them from their names. So I won't reveal all of them, but some of the recurring characters from the first story that come back in this one are Verity Hunter, first of all. So she's a black female. It would have been very easy for me to have a white male as the central character. But as a fiction writer, I set myself the challenge of creating a, a black female character and trying to imagine the way that she would see the world. So Verity Hunter means basically truth seeker, because that's what she is. So Verity is derived from Veritas in the Latin, which simply means truth. And then someone who's a hunter is seeking something. So her partner is called Keith Malcolm. Uh, I'm not actually going to reveal the meaning of that name. I'll leave it to readers to try and figure out how I came up with that one. They can have a bit of fun with it. We've got Max Zeal, who returns. He's a memorable character from the first story. Uh, he gets very passionate about uh, what he believes in, about truth and rights and freedom. I used to work with a DJ on the radio station in Oxford called Fox FM, and his name was Mark Zeal. That was actually his real name. So I've sort of taken his last name and called this guy Max Zeal because Zeal means passion when you've got a real passion for something. And then Max means to the max, maximum. So that tells you something about him. Then we've got, uh, let's see, May Pierce. So in the first story, she was a police officer and she came to realise the error of her ways when she uh, realized that she was actually serving Satanists and pedophiles. And she, you know, came to this startling uh, knowledge about the true nature of the police as an institution and what they're there for. So the word police is actually derived from policy because officers are enacting the policies of the real rulers of this world. So when we hear about police officers serving and protecting, we think that means they serve and protect the public. No, they serve and protect the elites. That's their job. So this character, May, comes to realise this. Her name means May Pierce, as in she may pierce the veil of illusion and see what lies on the other side. And in the first story, she does indeed do that. But in this story, she's a very troubled soul. Uh, and the other one that I have introduced is called uh, Danielle, Danielle uh, Motts. So her name means something as well. Danielle Leslie Motts. I'll leave people to work that one out. But she is a 21-year-old former student. She's just graduated from Oxford Uni. She's high-functioning autistic so what used to be referred to as Asperger's, and this gives her some quite unique insights and perspectives on the world. She's very good at piecing together clues. She's very good at spotting patterns, particularly in words. And she thinks that she's come up with uh, some little indicators of what's planned to happen in Oxford. So she joins together with Max Zeal and the others and becomes part of this group. And then the sixth one is Verity's cousin, Drew Hunter. So he was in the first book as well. And in this one, he is in a relationship with May Pierce. And the six of them are charged with the responsibility of putting down this terrible plot that they realize is about to happen. Something else that I've introduced in this story is a lot of background to the characters themselves. So I feel I've really developed them as people and I've given them all a past. And as part of the narrative, I've got some flashback sequences. So in the first book, uh, each chapter started with a date, and it was 1990 going into 1991. And in this story, everything's got a date as well at the start of the chapters. So you go uh, 25th of August 2001, which is where it starts. And that was the date of the death of Aaliyah, the R&B singer. She died in a plane crash in some quite fishy circumstances. 
on the 25th of August. So we find Drew DJing in a club in Derby and this other DJ crew comes along with the news and they say, oh my God, we just heard Aaliyah has been killed in a plane crash. And this is a representation of my own experience because on that date, I myself was DJing in a club in Derby and this other DJ crew came up. They were called the Firing Squad and they gave me the news of Aaliyah. So that's where the story starts. And then it progresses through the dates. So we go to 10th of September, 2001. Then, of course, 11th of September, 2001. And as the reader goes through, you see, you know, various dates. September 2001, October 2001, June 1977. And you're like, what? June 1977? What's going on? And then you will realise that it's a flashback sequence to the past of one of the characters. So Verity gets a flashback to 1977. Uh, Max Zeal gets a flashback to 1967 because he's a little bit older. We have May Pierce getting a flashback to 1979. And we have Keith getting a flashback to 1980. And each of these flashback stories tells you something about these characters. They were children or teenagers at the time, usually to do with their relationship with their parents. And this goes some way to explaining how they turned out the way they are and how they've got the value system that they have in the world. So it's a reflection of how all of our own past experiences shape the way we view the world and the way we behave and also our relationships with others. You know, they're very important. So I've got some soul searching going on with these characters. They're having to having to look deep within themselves. They're having to face some past traumas and they're having to work through them in order to get the job done. And of course, this is a reflection of what life is like for all of us. We've all got past traumas that need healing. We've all got past experiences that have shaped us into the adults that we now are. And I just wanted that element of things to really come through in the story. So hopefully that's an interesting addition to the narrative that people are really going to find of some benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, a real true reflection there, you know, um, and it's a very good uh, good point that you put into the book there, you know, because that's, that's uh, you know, where I'm on my journey. I'm sure you're on your own journey as well, you know, and uh, you, we all have our own uh, unique uh, ways of finding what we find within that you know for me what's helping me at the moment is uh, i've been looking into a lot of the Taoism sort of stuff and that's uh helping me a lot in my my own personal walk you know and stuff so uh yeah and you know that's what makes us um very beautiful and unique in our own ways mark and you know that's part of the spice of life isn't it you know <laughs> so yeah. yeah 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 it's not easy this uh this lark they call life uh it's not an easy ride uh, or if anyone is having an easy ride, they're the lucky ones, because for mm. most people, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. But um, I found it quite cathartic to write this book, because I put a lot of elements of myself into some of the characters. I've got a cameo in it, which I did in the first book as well, like an Alfred Hitchcock type cameo where I actually appear as myself, although I'm not named. But other than that, many of my own past experiences have gone into these characters and this is the great thing about writing fiction. You can create create people out of thin air and you can get them to act any way you want. You can get them to say anything you want. You are the god of your own fictional universe, you know. So I've created these six characters who must step into right action because if they don't, terrible things are going to happen to everyone. And I've created a few villains as well because we've got to have some baddies. So I've got three villains, the aforementioned Eugene Nix. Uh, there's Fabian Lucas, who is the Bishop of Oxford. And there's also a guy called Vic Astock. So I'll tell people that some of these names are anagrams. OK, so we've got Vic Astock. I'll leave people to work out that one. And these three are hatching this plot to blow up the building, the Radcliffe camera. They want to blame it on Muslim terrorists. Because in 2001, they were all the rage. You know, it wasn't the Russians back then. Uh, it was uh, Muslims who were get, getting blamed for all these terror attacks. And the idea is that they stitch up these two young Asian men 
who have been mind controlled. So we're getting into MK Ultra here, which is clearly a very real mind control program. It was perfected by the CIA in the United States, but of course it's active in the UK. And it wouldn't surprise me if Tavistock, the Tavistock Institute, had a hand in shaping and molding that mind control program. So you've got these two young Asian guys who've been programmed and they are basically patsies. They're going to be stitched up for the attack. There are elements of what happened on 7-7 here, those attacks in the UK, where you had these young men, young Asian guys with backpacks, and they got blamed for those explosions that happened in London, whereas many researchers have shown that what actually happened was something very different. Those explosions were remotely triggered from elsewhere, and it was just blamed on these guys. So I've got that aspect in the story where they're going to get stitched up for the attacks, but actually the explosions are coming from elsewhere. And the idea is to use it as an excuse to completely lock down Oxford into a nightmarish dystopian tyranny. Hmm, wonder where I got that idea from. So they want to cut off the city. They want to have people staying at home because they'll say it's too dangerous to be out. There's terrorists running around everywhere. They want to restrict people's movements, restrict people's ability to travel, and they want to introduce all kinds of draconian control systems. Again, can't think where I got that idea from. Must have just conjured it out of my imagination, right? <laughs> so that's what the event is planned to bring in. It's set in 2001, so it's kind of ahead of its time, you might say. But that is the basis of the plot. And as I say, I found it quite healing to write because... I really enjoy the process of writing fiction. You don't have to justify everything like you do with nonfiction. So you don't have to provide citations and resources for everything. It comes out of your imagination, but obviously there's a lot of truth in it as well. So I think the genre that best describes this book is truth fiction. And there's a few of these books around. I would like to see that genre recognized as an actual uh genre within literature it would be great to go into libraries and see a section called truth fiction because it's presented as fiction but actually you're getting a whole load of truth about what really goes on in the world who's really running things what this realm of existence is bringing in natural law and spiritual teachings as well and it's a great way to present it through fiction uh, i would love to see this book made into a tv show or movie uh, I don't imagine it will ever happen, but if it did, I think it would be awesome. But in the meantime, it remains a book or two books, as it now is. And um, I just found it a very valuable process. Yeah, and uh, I just love it, like to add to that, you know, so it's what comes from the creative mind, isn't it? You know, and, you know, you've, you've, you've showed that, Mark, <laughs> you know, by what you've done there, you know, because, um, you, you, yeah, that's, that's what the creative mind can do. It can... Uh, you know, it can um, show you things in the world and then just these things come out and in, in whatever way, whether it's through talking, sharing, uh, writing a book, you know, comes in many forms, Mark, many forms. But, um, yeah, the amazing thing, amazing thing to do, Mark, is to be able to share, share what goes, you know, uh, within us, but actually put it out there, you know, because if it stays in us, it's, it's in us and it doesn't go anywhere. So for you to take that and put it, you know, pen to paper you've made that tangible you brought it into the world you know um yeah. so thank you for doing that mark you know it's a well yeah, no worries man thing. i'm, I'm yeah. a big fan of physical books as well i like mm. things that you can hold yeah I'm very, I'm very old school i still use cds mm. you know most people <laughs> have graduated from cds but i just yeah. like tangible physical things that you can hold mm. rather than it just being in the ether somewhere mm -hmm. so there's a value to having actual books mm. and the creative process is incredible as you say because mm. some people are great musicians they're really good at writing impactive songs mm. and they can communicate in three or four minutes a really powerful message if it's delivered properly. Then you've got people who do great art. Maybe they can paint or do sculptures or whatever it may be. You have people who can make films. They're great at making documentaries. Uh, they're great at putting visuals together. You have people who are really good at graphics. They can design websites or flyers or 
whatever it may be. And everyone's got something to offer. This mm. is the great thing. This is the wonderful thing. Everyone can bring something to the table. So I can't really do any of those things I've just mentioned, but I can write. And then again, not everyone can write books. So, okay, I'll write the books and other people can do the graphics and, uh, you know, the paintings or whatever. As long as we all contribute something, then, uh, you know, we're headed to a very good place, I mm. would say. Mm. As long as it all stays rooted in the values of truth and freedom. Because there's a lot of us out there now, mate. There's more than we would realize, I'm sure. Mm. And a lot of these people will be sitting at home feeling very isolated. Uh, they probably can't talk to their friends or family or colleagues about what they've come to discover regarding the world and the true nature of these lives and what we're all doing here. But there's many other people like them. And uh, this is what's so great about these events that I do, because pretty much every weekend now I'm at some conference or other or some meetup group or some festival. And it's like minded people. Uh, I was at one last night in Litchfield in the Midlands and everyone can just speak freely. It's like a speakeasy. You know, you mm. can have these meaningful conversations with anyone in that room and they're going to be on the same level as you. Whereas you can't just walk into the average pub and start talking about the stuff that we do with the blokes in there that are drinking beer and playing darts, you know, because they'll think you're crazy. I can't have normie conversations anymore. You know, I could not walk into a pub and sit down at a table with 10 random blokes and have a conversation because what would I talk about? They'd want to talk about football or TV or whatever it is. Uh, I can't talk about that stuff. And they probably would have no comprehension of the sort of things that are important to me. But uh, as long as we can all find each other and uh, discover our tribes and link and bring something to the table and pool our resources, then that has got to be the way forward from here, right? Because I'm sure you'd agree humanity is facing some major changes right now, but uh, it's very far from over and things could still go either way. And there are a great many of us. We've just got to find ways of uniting, supporting each other and uh, moving forward. I don't have all the answers. I don't know exactly what that process is going to look like, but together we can all get it done. So uh, I hope that this book will leave readers in an optimistic place uh, because it does demonstrate what can happen when like-minded people get together and focus their consciousness on a common goal. After all, that's what our enemies do, right? That's what the so-called elites do. I'm sure there must be a lot of squabbling and infighting within their groups because they are psychopaths, they are mentally ill, but somehow, some way, they do seem to get the job done. At the end of the day, they do seem to be able to focus on a common goal and get that done. And we, the rest of us, who are absolutely massive in number, need to learn those disciplines. And we need to be focusing our will and intent and consciousness on what we want to create. And the point at which enough of us realize that and start applying it is the point where we really start winning and this insidious control system that we have is going to be on the way out. It is on the way out anyway, but, you know, we can quicken that process if we choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'd, I would just like to add to that as well. You know, um, I suppose what I, I'd like to share from that is um, where it starts is in community, you know, and, um, you know, just by the, the, the people that you spend time with, you know, and inviting them around to your house, you know, and uh, ha having food with them having those uh, conversations, you know, that uh, you feel free to have with them and stuff like that, you know, um, because there's a, lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that I've, I've, I've come into contact with over the, the last, you know, um, couple of years, you know, and uh, I sort of see it as, yeah, something as something that starts small, you know, I think um, when you're on that sort of thing to want to um, try and get out there and, and, and take the world on, um, that's too much of a far feat uh to take on i think it does start in the community it starts with the people that you're around it's very simple and then from out of that a, sort of a butterfly effect will happen um and we get to create our like you said our own world you know and it's just the small things you know a lot of people think um 
it has to be these big things, but it's actually very, very small things. I think that it's the small things that can that can change the big, the bigger picture. You know, um, just in our everyday daily life, you know, um, what we choose to do, uh, what we we choose to interact with each day. You know, um, you know, do I sit down there all day in front of a, key, a keyboard and tapping away, or being on the telly, or do I do something actually with my life and live that life experience? You know, Mark, right. these these are the things that I'm talking about, and um, you know, um, me getting out there, you know, next year again, putting on some connection sessions again, bringing some people together again, um, starting up a radio show that I'm going to do next year, you know, just playing some conscious music, having some conscious chats, you know, about um, different alternatives within health and things like that as well. So all these little things, they all play a part, you know. So, um, yeah, thank you, Mark, because, you know, us having this conversation, it brings the best out of me as well. So thank you. Oh, well, I'm glad yeah. it has some value, mate. Glad yeah. to hear that Thank it you. resonates. So yeah. our generation, I'm talking about the generation of adults in the world right now, Generation X, we're called, you know, people that were born mm. around the time that we were, have a huge responsibility placed on our shoulders. It will be Gen Z's turn soon, you know, uh, my children's generation. When they become adults, they're going to take on this responsibility. But previous generations have taken their foot off the gas or taken their eye off the road uh, whichever metaphor you want to use and they've allowed this insidious control system that we've got to gain so much power and because every single previous generation failed to put this control system down we now have that responsibility to do ourselves and really we're reaching the end of the road in terms of where these sickos have always wanted to take things. I really feel that the culmination of their plans, which have been getting cooked up for so long, literally centuries, actually, are happening right now. So we're very, very close to where they want to take things. Their final solution, if you like, which is having all of us living in these smart cities in these human settlement zones, as they call them. It's all United Nations Agenda 2030, uh, WEF Great Reset, this kind of stuff. Uh, 5G smart grid controlled everything, monitoring and surveillance, uh, digital currency, a social credit score system. Your every purchase, your every move is tracked and monitored, and your freedom of movement is severely restricted. That's where they want to take things. Not saying it's going to happen, because the plan is so crazy and so insane and so audacious that I just can't imagine how they're ever going to be able to pull it off. Even with the amount of normies that we have walking around thinking that everything's fine in the world, there's going to come a point where their lives become so affected by what's planned to be brought in that they're going to be saying, hang on a minute, what's going on here? There's no way they're going to allow this to come to fruition. But in the minds of the psychopaths, they're very close to completing what they've wanted to do for so long. And they're fast tracking it, which is why so much is happening so quickly all the time right now, because they work to deadlines. They want to get things done by a particular point in the timeline. And our responsibility, our generation, is to prevent that, to place obstacles in their path and to just not comply, just refuse all of it. Just do not participate in any of this madness that they want for us. And it can start with very small things, you know, continue using cash, use uh, human servers in supermarkets, actually, you know, queue up at the desk and pay one of the two or three people that they've got in the store instead of using the automated machines, because this is where they want society. They want everything to be automated and linked via smart grids and stuff. So there's small little steps that we can take to prevent that. Use local traders, support people in your community if you can, you know, mm. uh, avoid the supermarkets if you can. Uh, just these little steps. Uh, and if enough people started doing that, it would really send a clear message out and it would really start to change things. I mean, I've been hearing these suggestions on podcasts for years. So I woke up, to use that term, probably about 15 years ago. And even at that point, I heard guests on podcasts saying, oh, there's little small steps that we can take to prevent this. And here we are 15 years later, still having to reiterate those points. But uh, people are coming to these realizations who really can walk around in 2023 watching the BBC Evening News 
and thinking everything's just fine and dandy in the world? Who believes that things like uh, Russia and Ukraine, Gaza and Israel just happen? You know, they just blow up randomly and it's because people just can't get on with each other. Who really believes that th these sort of things aren't planned and aren't orchestrated because they're part of some bigger agenda? People are twigging, people are catching on, and uh, that's only going to continue. Unfortunately, while it does, it's a waiting game for all of us. And we're having enforced lessons in patience. I'm not a very patient guy, never have been. One of the life lessons that I'm being forced to learn is patience, is that things take time. You have to cast your will and your intent out there sometimes, and you have to wait for it to come to manifestation. And you don't know when that's going to be because it's out of your hands the minute you let it go. It's out there in the universe and it's down to creation, uh, the creative force, the most high, if people want to refer to the concept of God in that way. Uh, whatever your view of the universe and creation and how it works is, uh, you put out there what you want to achieve and then you trust I don't want to use the phrase trust the plan because that has connotations, but you trust the process and mm. you just wait for that to come to fruition. Mm. So that's all we can do, really. Uh, but many of us are doing that now. I've just bought myself a whiteboard and some marker pens and I write a message to myself on the whiteboard each day. And it's designed to enter my own subconscious and have an effect on the way I view the world and conduct myself. And uh, I think that's a very valuable thing. I think there's value in people uh, doing that for themselves. Mm. You're kind of hypnotizing yourself, if you like, which can be done, uh, implanting a message into your own subconscious mind that affects your belief system. Not easy. It's a skill that has to be mastered and it takes a bit of time. But I've reached the point where uh, I can see a lot of value in doing that. Yeah, yeah, and it is about, you know, like you're saying, um, the, the mind, you know, the mind in itself, you know, um, how it can um, it can entrap us, you know, and we have to find our own ways within that, you know, and uh, for me, you know, uh, looking to Taoism, that's, that's helping me in my own personal way um, with my own thought processes. Um, so in my own personal life as well, um, you know, it, it's... Uh, yeah, and you saying about sort of um, taking something that you would put into you and speak into yourself. I mean, I do that myself. It's only three little simple things, but I say that every day to myself, you know. And yeah, mantras. Yeah, like mantras. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think what, which is which is the one I I say, which is um, yeah, I think it's um, I come from greatness. I attract greatness. I am greatness. That's it. You know, and um, yeah, just that in itself, just speaking that into me each day, you know, it feels like I'm connecting with the universe, you know, the all, the source, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, the way, you know, yeah. that's that's what Taoism, you know, but it all goes beyond words as we know, Mark, you know, but yes, all these things help, you know, even a friend the other day was around here and he said, you know, some of these things that you share, you know, why don't you write them down? Like you were saying, put them on a the fridge you know and and yeah speak those things into you each day you know remind yourself of those things each day and i think they those things do help yeah so yeah absolutely away with you on that mark yeah yeah well I'll, I'll just share with the viewers the message that i've got currently written on the on the whiteboard mm. uh because it might help people in some way mm. so i've been through a few tough times in the last few days few challenges you know we all face them they differ from person to person but Life can be difficult. We have bad days, you know. Absolutely. You have to get through them somehow. Mm -hmm. So I've written on this board, aren't the good times always worth making it through the bad ones to get to experience? So you have to ride out the storm. You're having a bad day. You just have to accept that it's a bad day. Okay. And you've got to get through it. Mm -hmm. But there's something on the other side. And there's a very strong chance that tomorrow will be a much better day. And at some point in the near future, you've got some great stuff to look forward to. You've just got to trudge through this bloody storm, this, this you know, 
shit yeah. that you're going through to get there. So that's mm, one message. Mm, mm. And then I've written to myself, don't I always find a way, no matter how hopeless things can seem? Doesn't the universe always provide in the end? And so that's a message that I'm just trying to soak up into my mm. subconscious because our minds can be our greatest enemies. If we let our minds run amok, there's all kinds of chatter and nonsense that can go on there. There's all kinds of negative messages and negative thoughts that can just rampage through your mind if you let them. Mm. So you have to take control of your own mind and make sure it's not working against you, but it's working for you. Mm. And again, that's not an easy process. I don't claim to be any kind of master at that. I'm a work in progress myself. I've got a lot to do on that front. But um, we have to gain control of our own minds. I do talk a lot about mind control because that's come up in my research into the music industry and what really goes on, MK Ultra and Monarch programming and all this kind of stuff. So I understand exactly how that works, how to mass mind control huge populations that's what gets done through social engineering uh, culture creation coming out of the likes of tavistock and the cia and uh you know uh, stanford research institute and all these places that specialize in all that stuff so i understand how mind control works on a mass basis to uh, affect the perceptions of huge groups of people entire populations of nations you know that's been going on a long time but in terms of individual mind control, uh, that's when it becomes more convoluted, I guess. Mm. That's where, you know, a skilled hypnotist can really get inside your mind. So you kind of have to trust them if you're giving them the key to the dark recesses of your mind. But on that personal one to one basis, uh, a lot can go on in your mind so mm. you've got to make sure it's not working against you you've got to make sure you're telling yourself the right messages and you've got to try and stay on top of things and try and stay positive and in control uh, so again that's something that i'm trying to improve in myself mm. uh, and we all go through it this is a message that i'm sure is going to resonate with a lot of people watching this and everyone will have their own coping mechanisms. And that's fine. You know, whatever method you've got of coping, of making it through, so long as you're causing no harm, so long as whatever that coping mechanism is, is not inflicting any kind of uh, harm, damage or loss on anyone else, then it's fine. It's mm. whatever gets you through the night, right? That yeah. was a, a John Lennon song lyric. <laughs> Whatever gets you through the night, it's all mm. right. It's all right. As long as it's causing no harm, mm. if you've got a way of making it through and you can cope and it gets you from one day to the next, then, you know, knock yourself out, fill your boots, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Absolutely, Mark. Wow. And, you know, that's so good to sort of um, sort of come to a, sort of to, end, to the end of this podcast on a sort of a positive note, you know, because, again, you know, it's all these little things that help. You know, and uh, whatever it may be, you know, uh, you know, even in, in I mean, I've, 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 like I said, I'm sort of studying Taoism at the moment, you know, and that's really helping me in my life. But one of the things I'll say is there's no right or there's no wrong way in Taoism. You know, it's your way, <laughs> you know, and each and that's just how I look at it. You know, you have to find your own personal way within that. So, yeah. Well, it's as long as it causes no harm, damage or loss to Absolutely. another living sentient being. That's yeah. the golden rule. You know, yeah. if, if yeah. it causes no harm, mm. it's a right. It's mm. a right in creation. Yeah. The only point at which it stops being a right and it becomes something that you should not be doing is when it inflicts on somebody else mm. against their will. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it, absolutely. It is very simple. It's very simple. It message. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is it. When you, and again, you know, uh, I look into these things, you know, and I think, yeah, that's so simple, Sim very simple me messages, you know, very simple is um, <clears throat> unfortunately it's us that gets in the way, it gets in the way of ourselves sometimes that this is the problem. But when you start to see these things and these things come in, they are very simple. They're, they're, they're uncomplicated, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's, um, I used it's to very... have a mantra pinned up around the house, mm. blue tack to the wall in various rooms. And again, it was a very simple phrase. Mm. Do not treat others in a way you would not wish to be treated yourself. And it was designed for my daughters, you know, to try and instill that message in them. Mm. 
And uh, just imagine if everyone in the world, mm. bar the psychopaths, because you can't help a psychopath, but if everyone else in the world would just observe that very simple rule. Mm. If you wouldn't want it done to you, don't do it to someone else. Mm. It's that simple. It really is, if isn't you, it? If you don't want to be assaulted, if you don't want to have your rights taken away, if you don't want to be stolen from, if you don't want to be defrauded, if you don't want to be told lies and deception, if you don't want to be duped, if you don't want to be conned, if you don't want to be exploited, don't do that to anyone else. And if everyone would observe it, just imagine how much better this world would be. Mm. But for some reason, we've got egos getting in the way. We've got uh, what people will term human nature, uh, competitiveness, backstabbing, jealousy, envy, all this kind of stuff. All these negative emotional states that people find themselves mm. in mm -hmm. and past traumas coming back to haunt them, creeping up on them like a mugger in a dark alley. And because of all that stuff, uh, people just don't seem to be able to follow that rule, that very, very simple rule. Mm. the golden rule but if only they would if only mm. we could get back to that that's what should be getting taught in schools mm. it's clearly not but mm. imagine you know if every wow. child in every school around the world were taught do not treat others in a way you would not wish to be treated yourself imagine them having that mantra every single day that they go to school imagine how much different things could turn out when they get churned out of that school system at the end uh, you know, and clearly that those sort of messages are not what are getting taught in schools. It's propaganda and mind control. Uh, and that's because the controllers know how powerful a message like that could be if mm. it were communicated on that mass basis. So mm. it really is that simple, just getting that message across to as many Gen Zers, you know, because they're the next generation that's going to have to step up Gen Z. The responsibility is going to fall on their shoulders you know, we'll be done in a couple of decades, we'll be spent, you know, uh, and then it'll be up to them to sort out what happens in the world. So uh, yeah. yeah, we'll be on our new adventure. <laughs> Lord, Lord help <laughs> us. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and again, very, very simple messages, Mark, very, very simple, you know, and that's how life should be. You know, like I said, we, we ourselves, we're the only ones that complicate things too much, you know, this is it. And um just you know all i can say is to just you know each person out there just to live your life you know and uh live live your life experience you know because uh, they're the opposite of that you know and uh live by your true nature you know it's all in us you know it's it's there you just got to rediscover it again you know um, I, I knew what my true nature was before i got into school and that's when it started to <laughs> you know all get robbed away you know so sometimes i say go back but go back you know but go back to your you know, to those days, those days before school, and reflect on that. You know, that young inner you. You know, and stuff and all that. You know, and you'll see some beautiful things there. You know, so, but um, yeah, yeah. it's just yeah. I mean, I, th I think I saw something the other day. They're trying to even get you know, children into school even earlier now as well. So this is our uh, the next step. You know, and stuff. It's just like yeah. So um, I'll, I'll end on that note. You know, nature is the answer. You know, and um, it's it's all there waiting for us. And you know? we just got to go within you know and discover that for ourselves in whatever way that is mark so thank you for your your great insights mark and for the, the time you spent here today and um yeah yeah maybe we can do this again at some t some point in the future mark you know because it's it's just nice i suppose for you and it's you know to, to sometimes come away and have these sort of deeper conversation sometimes mark you know it is yeah yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we usually end up doing these in november for some reason so yeah, yeah i don't know why yeah yeah we're probably maybe, regrouping maybe, november 24 yeah yeah yeah, most yeah probably. it, it, it yeah. is good for me to step away from my usual mm. stuff so i did a presentation last night in litchfield yeah. and it was yeah. talking about the beatles and the rolling stones and how those groups were used for social engineering and they were both controlled they were pushing agendas uh, but it's nice for me to have different kinds of conversations like this where we get mm. into some really meaningful subjects, you know, mm. forget all the bloody pop music and uh, entertainment and stuff. What are these lives? You know, who are mm. we? What are we doing here? Where are we headed? Uh, I've done a yeah. soundtrack, actually, to this book. Mm. So with these novels, I put together movie style soundtracks and they consist of music from the times. So in this case, it's a lot of tunes from 2001 that were getting played at that time and i've interspersed it with news footage clips 
So you got things like George Bush and Tony Blair uh, talking about the 9-11 attacks and all this sort of stuff. There's a lot from Bill Cooper, the late, great uh, Milton William Cooper, who was this U.S. Marine and uh, Navy intelligence guy who became a whistleblower. He became very uh, disillusioned with what he'd come to discover about the true rulers of society, wrote the book. Uh, Behold a Pale Horse, of course, an absolute classic. So I've featured some quotes from Bill Cooper, both in the book and in the soundtrack. But another event that also just got a cursory mention in the narrative was the passing of George Harrison in November of 2001. So he finally checked out at that point, aged 58. And there was a piece of news footage that I'd used uh, in the soundtrack when they announced the passing of George Harrison, they just played this very simple clip. And he said, the meaning of life is to work out who are we, where are we headed, and what lies on the other side, or words to that effect. Mm. And I thought, wow, what a profound message. That's not a message you'd ever hear Paul McCartney or Ringo Starr say. Mm. Uh, but George Harrison was always the more spiritually inclined Beatle. Mm. And so that's a statement that resonates with everyone or should. Mm. And it's mm. a question that we should ask ourselves every day. Who mm. are we? What are we doing here? And where are we headed? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, again, a reflection of uh, my friend that came around here the other day, you know, and he was sitting here, you know, saying certain, sharing certain things with me. I won't go into the details of that, but, um, you know, as he was sharing these certain things with me, I was just like, you're asking all the right questions you know and uh, that was good that was really really good and uh yeah. you know it was just um nice to be able to sit there and just listen you know not to actually come in and, and sort of give him any direction it was it was him pouring out you know his soul you know those are real questions you yeah know, those questions matter absolutely um, who won the football match last night <laughs> or what happened in eastenders doesn't yeah. matter uh, this is the stuff that does yeah, these kind yeah. of questions absolutely absolutely and you know that's, that's real what i call real soul searching you know so uh yeah yeah that's what a, we've done on this show today isn't it yeah absolutely brother absolutely so thank you mark and um thank you for your your, your great um insights and for sharing about your book as well is there um any sort of any final words you'd like to share before we sort of bring this podcast to a close well, I think I've shared them already throughout this chat. Yeah, you know, I've yeah. really enjoyed having the conversation. If people want to get inside the book, it, it is on Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, that nasty corporation, but it's a great way of getting hold of books, you know, if people yeah. want it simply. But I do have copies that I can mail out myself. So people have just got to drop me an email uh, to markdevlin2022 at protonmail.com. And then we can arrange that. There's a soundtrack to the book, as I say. So you can listen to some of the stuff that was happening in 2001, music and news footage. There's going to be an audio book just as soon as I get the chance to record it, because these things take absolutely ages, literally months. And also I've got a PDF document called The Gift and the Curse Decoded. And this is where I break down elements of the story and I talk about where they came from, what inspired it. Uh, if there are metaphors or allegories, I reveal what they are. So this is a process whereby the reader is best off reading the book themselves and coming up with their own perceptions and then reading the decoded document and seeing how much they got right and how much they spotted. So I think that's quite an interesting thing to do as well, which other authors don't do. Uh, and that's another reason why I just love writing these fiction books. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, thank you, Mark. And um, also, you know, we, we obviously know as well, you, you know, you, you, you still do. Do you still do your, your um, you share, share your sort of um, your mixes and stuff on Mixcloud? Is that right? And stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. You do your sort of weekly thing there, don't you as well and stuff, Mark? Yeah. So I do. Yeah. I've got a yeah, show called The Sound yeah. of Now. Yeah. And yeah I really yeah. love doing that. I've actually got to do a new episode yeah. tomorrow. OK. This is Soulful Uplifting House. Yeah. So yeah. unfortunately, I've been so busy the last few weeks. I went to Australia, did a mini tour of uh australia mm. and i was just unable to do that show for three weeks so my good friend andy spencer from birmingham stepped up and he's hosted that show for the past three weekends for me so i'm very grateful to andy for that but i need to get back to doing it myself from this weekend 
And I find that very healing and cathartic mm. as well, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I love feel good, soulful, uplifting house. Yeah. Uh, that music really puts me on a high, really gets me buzzing with life energy, mm. unlike any other genre. So mm. I mm. love putting that show together. And that's every Saturday on Mixcloud, The Sound of okay. Now. That will continue. Yeah, I'll put that in the um, uh, underneath uh, for the viewers as well, um, that link. And also I'll put uh, links in for the uh, book from Amazon as well. For, for, sure. for the viewers as well so i'll do I'll, I'll make sure i'll do that as well for you mark have you sort of got any um gigs coming up and coming gigs sort of like djing wise out and about or DJ gigs. Like that? Uh, yeah is there anything sort of you got sort of coming up at all or yeah well every now and again i get asked to drop a dj set at mm. an event where i'm doing a talk so yeah. at festivals i quite often do a talk in the afternoon and then early evening i drop some tunes so i'm doing that at uprise and shine so they've okay. got an event at canada waters which is in east london it's in sort of docklands area and okay it's happening saturday 2nd of december so right. they've invited me to do a dj set there okay. and then the following day sunday 3rd of december I'm at a venue in Nuneaton, Warwickshire in the Midlands, uh, and that's hosted by the same group that put on the Litchfield talk last night. That is a day of speakers. They've got Fergus Greenwood, author of 180 Degrees. Carl Vernon is speaking. Then you've got some comedians, conscious sort of uh, unwoke comedy. Um, also some musicians and I'm going to be doing a DJ set at that one as well. So that's Sunday, 3rd of December. And then hopefully next year, there'll be a fair few festivals where I'll be speaking plus DJing because mm. I like to drop the odd DJ set still just mm. as long as it's not late at night because I don't do late nights anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm with you on that one, Mark. <laughs> As I've got a bit older myself, I can't do the late ones like I used to. I've got to be done that. by midnight. That's my yeah, idea. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you on that one. So yeah, all right, Mark. Well, thank you once again for your time, you know, and stuff and that. And uh, no what problem. can I say? What what can I say? What can I say? You know, and um, yeah, hopefully um next year we at some point maybe get to connect, you know, in the physical and that um try and get myself down to hope sussex or something like that because i know sometimes you're down there and you do bits and pieces down there so um yeah be nice to catch up catch up with you in the physical at some point mark and uh, i'll let you know about the connection sessions when they're on maybe um sure. if you would like to come down to join us or something for, for one of those but um yeah sure yeah so, once so again great. yeah yeah once yeah, again well, th thank well you. done for your own work as well you know yeah, keep up yeah. all your efforts and yeah. uh, you're doing great stuff down there so mm -hmm. uh much respect to you as well Yes, just those little things, isn't it, Mark? That we all we all do, you know. It all it all we helps. Do what we can, yeah. We all can. That's it. Well, much much love to you, uh, Mark, and um, yeah, look forward to maybe, maybe seeing you next November again for another podcast. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. All right, brother. <laughs> you never Cheers. know. All right. Thank you. Much right, love. Thanks. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thank you.